Well, welcome to the Dry Dock episode 197, part two. Uh, I guess I did eventually run out of time recording part one, but there you go. So there'll be two regular episodes of the Dry Dock this month, and then, of course, uh, back to the Patreon Dry Dock in the uh, first week of June, which will be the 5th, I think. In any case, let's get on with uh, more questions. Eric J. Van Duting asks, Accounts of the I-19 torpedo hit on North Carolina indicate there was a brief fire in the forward magazine, including oil on fire on the floor, but it was quickly extinguished in large part due to the inrushing seawater caused by the hit. Could you discuss the damage caused in this incident and how much of a threat of a magazine detonation there actually was, possibly if the strike had come in a slightly different angle or location? Well, here you can see the map the, of the ship that's actually on the USS North Carolina, which shows the extent of the damage. So areas in yellow are areas that were flooded as a result of the torpedo hit. And then you've got areas on the starboard side of the ship, you can see there in blue, which were counter flooding to address the list that she developed because of, well, several thousand tons of water coming in the port side of a ship where water generally is not supposed to be. Now, the kind of damage that it caused is, well, let's just say the extent of it is debated to a certain degree, um, not in the, what the damage was, but what the effect was. So sometimes you'll see people say, oh, yeah, well, you know, the damage was relatively minimal and she was able to keep station, etc. Yes, technically she was able to keep station for a while, but she was also sent back for repairs pretty quickly as you mentioned there were um there was burning oil that got into the sh the um powder handling room one of the powder handling rooms forward which in and of itself wasn't necessarily going to cause a magazine detonation but potentially could so for those of you who have been on a battleship and um, obviously, for those of you who haven't, we will obviously be doing a video showing you eventually. On the US Fast Battleships, the powder handling area is a fairly large chamber, but is separated off from the actual magazines by at least two sets of interfaces. So just the fact that burning fuel has gotten into there, I mean, it could cause an explosion of any charges that were in the vicinity, but that in and of itself isn't a mortal threat to the ship of course if one of those charges is close enough to one of the interlocks that it blows through the interlock and then potentially into the magazine then that could be a much larger problem um especially obviously if it spreads burning fuel at the same time but you know the, i mean the damage it did take a while to patch back up it was fairly serious and it the analysis of that damage did go on to influence later war US decision making on how to improve torpedo defense systems uh, but the I think in terms of how serious it was at the time I think probably the best way of answering that is to look at what the crew of the ship actually thought and well that can be summed up from the fact that the word was passed to make ready to abandon ship because of the fires that were burning down below and the potential of a magazine detonation and they knew which is why the the word was passed they knew that if the fire did get into the magazines and obviously they thought there was a reasonable chance it might the entire ship was just going to go up and that would be the end of it obviously it didn't the mixture of damage control and water flooding in because the torpedo hit meant that north carolina didn't explode but it was perhaps a, a closer run thing than some would have you believe. Um, she wasn't obviously in any immediate danger of detonating, but it could very well have gone that way if it hadn't been for the actions of the crew and the particular way that it went. Now, in terms of it, it being possible that the strike could have caused a det detonation directly, well, you see the areas in red. These are the areas that are highlighted as... The, at the greatest risk of fire for fire so obviously fuel bunkers and magazines are the primary ones although um, if you look at a similar map for the Iowa you'll see a little red spot right forward in the bow and that's because that's the paint store which you know tends to burn quite nastily in theory yes such a torpedo strike could have set off something in the magazines but it would be 
essentially either a matter of blind chance or a matter of two torpedoes hitting in the same area in close succession. If two torpedoes hit in the same area in close succession, obviously the first one's going to defeat most of the torpedo defense. The second one can exploit that and get a much closer detonation to the parts of the ship that actually matter. Um, or if it's a single hit in that, say there's just a blind chance luck piece of hot metal that lances through several bulkheads and winds up in the magazine, that's also a possibility. Um, but when you're talking about torpedo hits directly near a ship's magazine, it is very much a roll the dice situation. If the ship has half decent torpedo defenses, the magazine shouldn't explode. But there is always the chance of either the torpedo rolling a natural 20 or the ship rolling a natural 1. Um, so yeah, it's not out of the question that the North Carolina could have exploded, but it was relatively unlikely with a single hit. Michael Imbezi asks, Whilst ironclads are obviously built to fight other ships, it seems like most of what the ironclads of the American Civil War did was actually shore bombardment, stuff like supporting troops in campaigns along rivers and massive bombardments like the Second Battle of Fort Fisher. How accurate is this assessment? So whilst it might seem that way, and yes, obviously the various ironclads did spend a fair bit of time, especially the Union ones, doing shore bombardment, it would be a mistake to think they weren't that active at sea. They were, in fact, quite active in ship-to-ship -ship engagements. Now, obviously, especially after the Battle of Hampton Roads, the first engagement, no one was particularly keen to engage the other side's ironclads with non-ironclad warships, although occasionally it still did happen because of matters of necessity. But there were, both on the rivers and on the coasts in, and in harbours, a reasonable number of ironclad versus ironclad battles or battles that involved ironclads fighting each other with other ancillary ships um, also fighting each other all the way right up to the end of the war it's not necessarily as widespread uh, if you like a capital ship engagement as some other wars like the napoleonic wars but um Part of that is simply because, well, the Confederates didn't have that many ironclads, and so there were only uh, so many battles that you could actually fight. <laughs> you know, it's not like every single port had a Confederate ironclad for the Union ones to go up against. But there were some fairly vicious ones, like this one, the first Battle of Charleston Harbor, uh, which was you know, involved multiple Confederate and Union ironclads on both sides. So... Whilst supporting, transporting troops, shore bombardment, yes, that was kind of the bread and butter of a lot of um, Union ironclads. Other Union ironclads did spend a fair bit of time blockading, and there were quite a number of naval battles. Um, at some point in the future, maybe once I've got done with the Anglo-Dutch Wars series that I keep planning and then putting off, um, maybe I should do a series kind of like the Guadalcanal one that actually charts the various large-scale naval engagements of the American Civil War. If I do every single like ship versus ship action, it's going to be forever and a day, but at least the big ones like this one I can talk about. HMS Inadvisable asks, Pretty much all of the RFA fleet oilers and tankers of World War II, with the exception of the smaller Ranger class, had a superstructure with a funnel in the back and another superstructure in the middle of the ship. What were the main reasons for such a consistently split superstructure? It's a feature of tankers at the time, and uh, something that has reoccurred in various ways, shapes, and forms since in various types of ships. Essentially, unlike a dry cargo freighter, where you can have holds forward and holds aft, etc., for a tanker, you generally want to have the tanks for all the oil or other liquid that you're carrying running as much of the full length of the ship as you possibly can. And that means you can't have machinery spaces amidships where you would normally have them on a, on a dry bulk good, goods freighter. And so on tankers, you have the engines usually mounted right aft, which is why the funnel's there as well, because the boilers, the engines, they're all, all uh, quite close packed together. You see this on uh, US tankers like Simmering class as well. Now... The reason for having a separate superstructure forward, however, is that it's much, much easier to command and guide a ship from forward. Um, so these days with modern super tankers, yeah, everything's at the back because with modern electronic systems and the sheer size and uh, you know, 
not so rapid handling of modern tankers it doesn't make much odds where you are but back in the day when you had to navigate more by eye than by anything else having the superstructure forward as you can see here with one of the dale class tankers this allowed you to actually you know steer and guide the ship much much more effectively you could also guide operations much more effectively because you're in the middle of it all and the superstructure could be built over the top of the hull so there would be oil tanks etc underneath that whilst the engines and their associated superstructure and funnel would all be aft so that's the reason for this split layout for tankers specifically in the world war ii period and as i said because it's easier generally to command a ship from further forward it's also one of the reasons why on the more recent queen elizabeth class carriers you have this island split because where it's more optimal to put the machinery spaces and for a carrier where it's more optimal to organize the flight group from is further aft but where it's better to con and steer the ship from is further forward and hence the split island michael gilson asks during the solomon islands campaign when the japanese navy tried to run supplies in oil drums hoping to float them ashore would they have in the short run been more successful if they'd made the oil drums look more like contact mines to delay any u.s navy approach to the barrels perhaps having some sh ships deploy actual contact mines of course, if it worked, it'd actually be worse for the Japanese, as the longer the Solomon campaign lasted, the higher Japanese losses would have been, but nonetheless. Um, not particularly, because when they launched the chains of drums that were supposed to have all the supplies in them, the idea was that a combination of the tide and inertia from being launched from destroyers that were racing towards the shore would carry them ashore or at least close enough to shore that small boats and stuff could go out and pick them up. Once you get into a period where they're just floating out at sea, they're not really much use to the Japanese at all, because um, for them to go out far out into the sea, or one, how are you going to find them? Um, they're obviously fairly low profile. And two, you know, if it's going to take you half an hour an hour to get out to sea pick the things up and then probably an hour to an hour and a half to tow them back again bearing in mind you've only got small boats and these things weigh a fair bit you're going to be attacked by aircraft or u.s navy vessels so basically anything that wasn't drifting immediately offshore or didn't drift ashore was lost to them at which point whether or not they look like mines whether they look like barrels whether they look like anything it's not going to really help the Japanese ashore all that much. Sure, it might make the Americans a slightly, slightly more cautious about approaching them. But all that's going to do is, you know, probably mean they get shot with rifles and so forth from a slightly longer distance than what the US did with them historically, which was, to be honest, mostly ignore them, uh, occasionally sink them, and obviously with the first few salvage a couple to see what on earth was going on. Tom Marshall asks, I'm curious if you've read this paper, a uh, link in the question description, that examines the Britain versus German naval arms race. It makes the claim that the rising states will find it harder these days to take advantage of backwardness as military weapon systems become increasingly more complex. I did have a look and I found it to actually, at least in my view, be quite flawed in a couple of respects. Um, first of all... <sighs> I, I get the idea, what they're arguing, the, the advantage of backwardness is effectively the argument that a rising power will have an advantage over the current top dog because they can see all the things that the top dog's already done um, and done wrong. So basically they get a shortcut to a near peer position on the R&D tree. And then the argument is, well, with everything being more complex these days, it's a lot longer path and more difficult for them to catch up so they won't have so much of an advantage so the reason i find it a flawed argument as i said is twofold the first element is some of it reads almost like some pre-world war ii assessments of the japanese um in the because the actual paper is addressing um, effectively asking why China hasn't caught up yet, which is a modern thing, which I'm not going to touch on too much. But yeah, part of it reads a little bit like the um, 
pre-war assessments of the Japanese where they're assu- almost, almost like they're assuming some kind of inferiority, which is stupid because technology is invented by people. People are humans. And, you know, whether they're Chinese, Japanese, British, German, French, American, Canadian, whatever, we're all humans. So if one set of people, one set of humans can develop a technology... There's nothing in the laws of physics or reality that says another group of humans can't also develop that technology. Sure, if it's more complex, it might take slightly longer to develop, but um, it's still going to happen eventually if they want to and there's enough of them. The other reason I find it flawed is that they've drawn this comparison between Germany as the rising state challenging Britain and China as the rising state challenging the US, and seem to have, I don't know what's the best phrase, ignored the elephant in the room, missed the woods for the trees, whatever. There's a huge difference between the two. Um, You know, the comparison is really only a superficial one and doesn't really apply because Germany, yes, navally, was not a competitive power with Britain up until they decided they were going to try and be in the late 1890s, But technologically speaking, in terms of the Industrial Revolution, its general national technological level, at the time that the Germans decided actually we're going to be, you know, competitive, we're going to try and build a navy that's competing with the Royal Navy, most of their technology was on a par. You know, there wasn't, you know, things like um, Zeiss lenses for binoculars and so forth, Krupp steel, um, and Krupp guns for that matter and so on and so forth, um, and in the more civilian sectors. You know, German Germany as a technological state was pretty much a peer with other major European powers, including Great Britain. There were certain elements of that that they were lacking, like turbine technology and so forth, and initially fire control tech, but it wasn't because they lacked the technological capability to build such things. It was simply that, you know, within the general gestalt of the German national industry, there wasn't uh, seen a need to build those things until someone else built them. And then they had to catch up. And obviously then they did eventually catch up. Uh, it was just a, a matter of applying a pre-existing technological level down a specific niche path to make a naval um effort building effort whereas um although they briefly mention it in the paper with uh, japan the china is again not not wanting to get into modern things but if i was going to make any comparison between historical naval build-ups and modern ones the more accurate depiction of of china rising to challenge the state the u.s in the modern day is probably better represented by Japan uh, and its rise because China is is actually playing an industrial technological catch up with the western world that you know as i said J- Germany at the time it decided to kick off its naval building efforts really wasn't um Japan obviously had to come out of a literal literal feudal near or near enough feudal era um economy and develop a modern shipbuilding industry um, so, I mean, it's it's not perfect either way, but I would say China's closer to Japan in the analogy than it is to Germany. The only way in which China arguably could be closer to Germany than, than Japan is in terms of overall relative industrial capacity compared to the people they're trying to compete against. But that's a very different thing from the technological advancement argument, which is what the paper is actually making. So I kind of get the claim they're trying to make but i don't think it's a particularly well-founded one and they definitely didn't choose the best examples danny o'brien asks can you give me your view of the three best and three worst destroyer classes of world war ii and why so i'm going to exclude late war era destroyers that might have only served a year or two if that in world war ii because it's a little bit unfair to include them up against stuff that was in service at the beginning or for the majority of that particular nation's involvement in World War II, just because, you know, massive technological leaps and so forth. But, and also, you know, of World War II suggests they actually did a significant amount in the war, which obviously late war ships wouldn't have done. 
so in terms of the three best, um, not strictly necessarily in terms of how well they perform, but how good they could have been, i.e. their potential, I would say you're probably looking at the Fletchers, which have both the actual real-life performance and potential. Uh, as you know, I'm a big fan of the Fletcher class. Then, in no particular order after that, probably the Akizuki class from Japan, because they actually have proper dual-purpose guns in a fairly heavy armament. Admittedly, mean, they're fairly large destroyers, but they actually have a proper, fairly decent dual-purpose armament. And, of course, they have long lance torpedoes, which overall makes them a very deadly package as far as what a start of the war destroyer is supposed to be. Um, the only real weakness you can point to with them is the fact that f to get the dual purpose guns, they had to go with 100mm, which is a little small for destroyers, especially destroyers of that size, by the time that we're talking about, i.e., World War II. But, you know, the rate of fire and the steadiness of the ship as a gun platform probably would have made up for that in any straight up destroyer dest versus destroyer engagements. And then lastly, I know Dr. Clark will kill me for this, but I'm not going to necessarily include the tribals on there. I'm actually going to include their successors, um, specifically the L and M classes. Uh, the J, Ks and Ns are very similar, um, but whilst the tribals are decent enough, uh, they're very good for anti-surface actions, um, the whole reason that the Royal Navy went with the J, K, L, M and Ns um, in two separate sizes was because they recognized perhaps the tribals were a little bit too gun focused um whereas with the that these later flotillas they had six guns instead of eight which still put them at the very heavily armed end of being destroyers but they went back to having a much larger torpedo armament and um across those three sim well no five similar flotillas um the lnms being slightly larger than the other three they are a much more rounded destroyer, I would say. So they're much more capable of taking the fight to all comers. Now, it would have been ideal if they'd had, you know, full-on good dual-purpose weapons, but the Royal Navy destroyers would have to wait until the, towards the end of the war when they got the 4.5-inch gun for that, albeit that some of the LNMs were armed with 4-inch guns instead of 4.7s, which gave them kind of put them in the same boat as the Akazukis of having decent torpedo on decent speed, decent size, decent dual purpose AI on armament. Might have been a little small in a surface action, but rate of fire probably made, would have made up for it. For the worst, you probably want to look at the Hatsuharas, the Type 1934s and Type 1934As, both for the same reason, stability issues, major ones. Um, you know, it's all well and good being a destroyer of whatever armament value or speed you like, but if you can't stay upright or you have to stay upright with great issue, you're not a very good destroyer design. And if I'm going to be particularly harsh, then I'd probably also go for the Sims class destroyers. Not necessarily on account of their war record, but on account of the fact they are being built right at the end of the 1930s, commissioned right through into 1940, so they're very definitely you know, benefiting from the lessons of pretty much all the interwar destroyer design. But when they were built, the only way to make them actually serviceable was to delete one third of their torpedo armament and one of their originally planned five five-inch guns. So as ships with four five-inch guns and eight torpedo tubes, they kind of did all right. But when you compare that to what they were originally supposed to be built with, that's a fairly big step down in capability. And they weren't the world's most expandable ships afterwards when you compare it to something like the Fletcher's ability to just absorb 20 and 40 mil guns ad infinitum almost. Yeah, they're, they're not particularly brilliant. The, the main reason they have a decent war service, at least in my opinion, is that at least the US Navy realised what a problem they had and did something about it ASAP, whereas the other two destroyer classes that mentioned on this in this section, either there was not too much done about them, or they were so badly designed that there physically wasn't anything that you could do about them. Toreno asks, For a long time, it seems that the museum ship USS Constellation was believed to be a rebuild of the original frigate USS Constellation from 1797, only seemingly confirmed as a separate ship late in the 20th century. 
One can only imagine the shock when it was revealed that one of the US Navy's supposed original ships was actually a completely different vessel. Do you know if this happened anywhere else in naval history? And how do historians and museums ensure situations such as this do not occur with artifacts in their care, all the way from ships down to smaller artifacts? Well, one of the key things is provenance, i.e., do you have an unbroken chain of ownership and documents to support that ownership going back to whenever it is you think the thing is from, or in the case of archaeological defines when it was found and where it was found, ideally the context it was found in. With Constellation, this was a little bit thrown for a loop because the US Navy themselves, for the majority of the 20th century, either believed or maintained, depending on whose account you, you read, that the ship was the original vessel rebuilt. So normally with a naval vessel, you would ask the Navy in question and you say, okay, well, is, is this the X vessel? And they'd say, yes, it is or no, it isn't. And in this case, the US Navy was for various reasons supporting the incorrect view, um, as it turns out, for quite a while. So there's a bit of an anomaly going on there with um, Constellation herself. Now, with that said, this isn't necessarily the US Navy's first rodeo when it comes to this kind of thing. Although, to be fair, 1854, it might be one of their earliest. As we've discussed before on the channel, you have things like the uh, Monitor USS Puritan, which is ostensibly, according to documentation, a repair of a American Civil War a monitor that hadn't quite been completed, but was in fact an entirely brand new ship. So although in that case, the US Navy knew exactly what they'd done, and these days it's public knowledge, at the time, you can imagine a bunch of US Congress people, perhaps 10, 15 years into its service, maybe someone eventually looks at the design specs and go realizes that the USS Puritan they're watching sailing up and down the East Coast is substantially different from the one that was supposedly repaired. Now, as far as museum ships are concerned, I'm not aware of anything on the scale of a full-on museum ship where someone's eventually turned around years and years later and gone, well, actually, that's not the ship we've been thinking it is at all. It's, it's this completely different one. It has happened on the smaller scale when you're talking about things like launches, sort of anything up to about 100 foot long, where various launches and fast boats, etc., have found, been found to either be different ships of the same class, i.e., so, you know, taking a random number, someone might think, oh, I have MTB 453, and it turns out, well, actually, no, you've thought that for 20 years, but this documentation proves it's MTB 460 or something like that. Um, so that kind of thing has happened on occasion. And then I guess kind of the inverse of people having what to them is just another old civilian craft boat whatever and then somebody showing up you know in the 90s or the 2000s with a bunch of documentation saying well yeah you might think this is just a general power launch or something but in actual fact this is a world war ii attack craft that was civilianized later on and people seem to have forgotten that um so that does happen on a semi-regular basis, people keep finding random survivors from World War One and World War Two tucked away um, in small boatyards and such. Connor Johnson asks, There are several famous examples of ships running away to avoid their fate, such as HMS Warspite, HMS Vanguard, and what was left of USS Oregon. Of all the breaks for freedom from the breaker's yard that you know of, which would be your favourite? Of all of them, I would have to say Warspite's my favourite, because whilst various ships did definitely show defiance going to the breakers. Most of the time, they tend to fall into one of two categories. You either have incidents like Oregon or Vanguard where they'll head off of their own accord, either into the deep ocean or into some nearby solid object, but eventually they're wrangled back into place. Occasionally, you'll get things like one of the Brazilian battleships that will just flat out disappear in the middle of the ocean, so no one knows where it's gone. War Spite, I think, falls into this lovely category where she struck a perfect balance between the two, in that everyone knew where she'd gone, so she didn't just disappear off the face of the planet, but she made a point of, dis of sort of detaching herself from being towed and going aground so hard that unlike Vanguard going aground in Portsmouth or Oregon wandering off into the Pacific, despite everybody's best efforts, they couldn't get her off and take her to the breakers. Um, 
and she continued to cause casualties for the salvage vessels and tugs that were trying to to move her and so in the end basically one last battle forcing the enemy to come to her as it were she was gonna stay out of the breakers yards and if they were going to break her up they were going to go and have to do it on site as it were which just made things even more difficult for them which i think is pretty much in keeping with the characteristics of the ship Reva asks, one of the key moments of my wife and I's trip to the USS New Jersey was while she was still struggling with the point to such a massive vessel, we came across a mock-up of just what a 16-inch shell looked like, bigger than her, and suddenly the sheer scale of everything clicked into place as to just what this enormous machine was built to use and to withstand. On your trip, would it be possible to get photos of reasonably consistently scaled humans to vessel shells? Uh, wherever such examples are possible, so the actual difference between these various guns can be comprehended via the visual media of Drac. There are going to be various videos of me either standing by or handling, depending on the scale, uh, various shells on various ships, so that will definitely be coming. Uh, you do sometimes see this picture bandied around, which is the uh, £2,700 Mark VIII shell, supposedly next to a person, which does make it look very, very large. Um, but if you look closely, well, there are two things. One that's a relatively short person uh, and two you can also notice there's a little bit of false perspective being forced here the shell is much more in the foreground the guy's much further in the background so uh, not quite exactly accurate although it does look impressive for a perhaps more reasonable perspective here is the six foot nothing of me uh, in New Jersey's shell room or one of New Jersey shell rooms and so you can see yeah they're big but they're not quite as tall as me they're a few inches shorter and yes I'm going to be using this picture a lot because it is a fun picture I'm going to get as much mileage out of it as I possibly can. <laughs> Daxerp asks Drank if you could command one ship of any type from any era or navy what would it be and why? If I had my choice of absolutely anything possible I would probably go with a Razé frigate because that means I get all the independent action and uh, freedom of command that a frigate captain does, but I'm also one of the biggest, nastiest, most powerful and probably swiftest frigates out there, so I don't have to worry too much if I spot an enemy frigate or two um, or a few enemy light vessels. I don't have to start debating what to do. I just go, hmm, more prizes for me and start hoovering them up. And since I'm not a ship of the line anymore, then I don't have to sit around on blockade duty for endless periods of time for the most part. Um, nor do I run the risk of being turned into so much human salsa by, you know, a 50 gun broadside. So, yeah, it's it's pretty much, as far as I can tell, the, the ultimate in naval command. Almost in complete freedom of action, pretty much uh, almost 100% confidence in either being able to take on or get away from anything that you might come across. And the chance to also make yourself a fair bit of cash, you know, hoovering up all those nice tasty prizes. Sworn brother of the Ballistic Order of St. John Moses Browning asks... When you get to San Diego on your trip, you might see the memorial to USS San Diego CL-53 adjacent to USS Midway. Indeed, I did. Uh, being born and ra raised in San Diego, I've always had an interest in this ship, which rarely seems to get much historical recognition, despite having more battle stars to her credit as the more famous USS San Francisco, having never lost a man in action, being the first significant US service combatant to enter Tokyo Bay, and taking the surrender of the battleship Nagato. Why do you think this ship goes so unsung, and are there any other ships with a similar record that also get unfairly ignored? Well, I think there definitely are a lot of ships out there that have similar records that also do get somewhat unfairly ignored. But I think a lot of this comes down to two factors. One is, the larger the ship, the more crew it has. And sometimes a lot of the stories about a particular ship will come about because people who were aboard the ship will tell that story and obviously it's not just you know with a cruise of several hundred people with a battleship there are over a thousand um, but it's also that assuming the battleship lasted any particular length of time once you take into account crew rotations people coming on off off and on a ship if a battleship served throughout the entirety of world war ii you might have had you know up well upwards of four to five thousand and possibly more people who can say they served aboard that ship in that conflict 
which even when distributed across a country is a fair number of people will bring sh that ship to everybody's attention whereas a small cruiser with a much smaller crew even if it runs through the entire war and has a similar amount of crew turnover is just there's physically fewer people to talk about it and on top of that it, you also combine it with the fact that the ships that tend to get remembered the most are usually the ships that are kind of up front and center being seen to do something whether that be destroying or capturing the enemy and fairly or unfairly those tend to be the ones people remember because they're not necessarily remembering the entirety of the ship's career but they're remembering highlights of the ship's career so you know if you asked obviously the state of education in terms of maritime matters in the uk is shocking these days but if you ask most older people in the uk who knew anything about naval matters what hms rodney did they'd be able to tell you she fought bismarck they wouldn't necessarily be able to tell you much else about her world war ii career and similarly um you know with uh, something like uss washington i would could bet a fair number of n sort of vaguely navally inclined americans could tell you that washington fought kirishima and a reasonable number could tell you she was admiral lee's flagship but if you ask them what else did washington do suddenly it's like oh and so i think with san diego and with a number of other ships like that because she didn't get the final killing blow in any major actions despite the fact she was present for a lot of different actions there's not that immediate associative memory going on with her. I mean, for example, HMS Norfolk would be a great example of a Royal Navy equivalent in World War II. So obviously Rodney was there for the killing of Bismarck. Duke of York was there for the sinking of Scharnhorst. Norfolk was there for both and did a bunch of other interesting stuff in between. But people have heard of Rodney. They've heard of King George V, obviously heard of Hood, Prince of Wales. Um, they may even well have heard of Duke of York but not so many people will have heard about Norfolk because although she was there for you know both German battleship sinkings in surface actions in World War II, she wasn't the one that landed the killing blow or did the majority of the damage, and so she tends to be somewhat forgotten in much the same way I think has happened with poor San Diego. Mr. V asks, since you're going to see USS Yorktown, I have a question about the ship specifically the other ship at that museum how was the uss laffey able to be put back into action after being nuked well the simple answer is she wasn't exactly nuked um laffey which you can see here just on the left uh, from this picture taken up on the island of uss yorktown laffey was a support vessel for operations crossroads now that doesn't mean she escaped uh, radioactive contamination. In fact, she was heavily radioactive by the time it was all over because as a support ship she helped move in to look after what was left of the target fleet after the explosions and as such she picked up an awful lot of radioactive contaminant from spray and the water she was moving through. In order to get her back into service and make her you know, not horrifically radioactive they had to sandblast basically every exposed surface of the ship right down to bare metal to get rid of any radioactive isotopes that made themselves at home as well as basically refit and replace any part of the ship's interior fittings that had been exposed to salt water so things like you know the salt water fire main system and so forth all of that had to go um just to get rid of the radioactive elements and the but after that she could be repainted and put into service again Jeffrey Connolly asks, is it true that one of the early Lexington-class battlecruiser designs was similar to the British Splendid Cats? And what are some good books to look into the design studies as there doesn't seem to be anything on the internet to delve more into the ships? Well, a good start if you want to learn more about the preliminary designs for the Lexington class would be to get Warship 2011, if you can find a copy. Uh, because that has an article in it by Trent Home, a most excellent gentleman who's been on the channel a couple of times, and he has an article in there which is all about the Lexington-class battlecruiser designs. And then I'd kind of evolve onwards from there. So um, Friedman's US battleships, for example. And the, the ironic thing is that there's mentions of the Lexingtons for obvious reasons in Friedman's US carriers and US battleships, as well as some mention in his uh, US cruisers. So if you've got all three, then great. Uh, if you want to know about the preliminary designs for the Lexingtons as battlecruisers, you probably want to just focus on the battleship one. 
Although there's also a fair bit of mention in the cruiser one. Anyway, um, specifically in terms of a Lexington preliminary design being like the Splendid Cat, this one is probably the closest, but also not. Um, so the reason I say this is the closest to being like a Splendid Cat is that it's got eight guns. <laughs> All of the other preliminary US uh, battlecruiser designs for the Lexingtons are even more diverse. The other Lexington preliminaries either have more 14-inch guns or they use 16-inch guns. This ship has eight 14-inch guns, so near enough as makes a difference, close enough to eight 13.5s. But even so, it's 35,000 tons and change, so it's a lot heavier than any of the Splendid Cats. It's faster than any of the Splendid Cats with a design speed of 30 knots. Its gun turret layout is completely different. Obviously, the Splendid Cats mostly have a Q turret and a midships turret, and then Tiger has kind of the staggered aft, whereas this has two super firing forward, two super firing aft, arguably a much better layout. It's got all or nothing armor, whereas the Splendid Cats had distributed armor. And for all the memes about British battlecruisers, this thing is even worse protected than an Invincible class. Um, verging almost on indefatigable levels of terribleness because it's it has an all or nothing belt but it's only five inches thick so what exactly they thought this was going to be able to defend itself against in 1915 in terms of other battle cruisers i'm not entirely sure the absolute closest to a splendid cat design that you would probably ever come across is one that predates this one by about three years. So it's not part of the Lexington class design lineage, but it is a 1912 proposal, which actually looks remarkably similar to in in some ways to this one, at least in in general terms. It's still got the two super firing forward, two super firing after layout. So you know, um, it is a not slower at 29 knots. So we're perhaps approaching the capabilities of the upper end of the Splendid Cats at this point. And in armour terms, the, the 1912 design does actually have a proposed 10-inch thick belt, which is comparable to the 9-inch thick belt of the Splendid Cats. Um, although, again, it's mostly an all-or-nothing ship with a bit of armour of the steering gear. So it's not exactly comparable but that's probably the closest you're going to find the 1912 u.s battlecruiser proposal but even then it's only vaguely in the ballpark of being similar to the splendid cats and oh, oh mainly only by dint of the fact that it's got a vaguely similar armament because its displacement is still pretty high <laughs> uh very very high in fact compared to a splendid cat Duke Master asks, Tony Robinson had worse jobs in history, giving us a look into the past's least desirable jobs. Today, we're going to have Drakenefell's worst jobs at sea. Give us a selection of the worst jobs any sailor had, civilian or military. Well, there's a long list across history. Um, I would say anything to do with coal and a prolonged exposure thereunto in the 19th and early 20th century, particularly if you're having to shovel coal, um, whether you're shoveling it from the coal bins or whether you're shoveling it into the engine, into the boilers, um, because, well, it's incredibly heavy-duty work. You're probably going to end up with all sorts of muscle and back issues. You're going to end up covered in coal dust. You're going to be filthy. You're going to be in an incredibly hot, humid environment pretty much all the time. And you probably get to die early of emphysema or some other wonderful um, disease of the lungs through having in ingested so much coal dust and inhaled it. So that's a fairly terrible job. Um, galley slave is a classic one, especially, you know, well, it's like especially when the galleys are crewed by slaves. You know, they're not particularly well treated. You're probably going to die and you're probably going to die very horribly. So again, definitely one of the worst jobs you could have at sea. Um, also, generally, the average sailor's lot in, I would say, probably from the mid-16th through to the mid-18th century, 
simply because that's the kind of time period when most navies were operating their ships at considerably long ranges for considerable periods of time, but before anyone had really figured out how to stop scurvy, at which point between tropical diseases and scurvy, most expeditions kind of were set forth with a built-in acceptable loss ratio percentage, which was well into the double digits of percent, which... Yeah, that's not pleasant because, well, you know, either you'll die horribly of tropical diseases or scurvy, which is what they're expecting because then they don't have to pay you. Or if you survive, you're probably going to survive in a horribly weakened state with, you know, bent limbs and missing teeth and so on and so forth. Um, <laughs> there, there's, there are many reasons why it was somewhat difficult to entice sailors to participate in mil long military voyages, and that was certainly one of them, at least until, you know, they started distributing lemon juice, lime juice, and all sorts of other wonderful sources of vitamin C across the fleets in question, depending, obviously, on which fleet, depending on what treatment you got. I suppose added to that, you could have um, lookout position, on a British ship where they had cleverly put the mast behind the funnel, because uh, then you just get to choke on fumes all day. Damage control officer on a Japanese aircraft carrier in World War II, because the US Navy was really out to ruin your day and would, in almost every case, be inevitably at some point very, very successful at it. And if you want to be really, really picky, um, <laughs> Any sailor who signed up for a voyage that turned out to be one of the early circumnavigations, whether it be Magellan's, Drake's, or Anson's, or various other people in immediate proximity to them, any of the crews that ended up sailing with any of those men, well over half of them ended up dead. A very, very high mortality rate. And then, of course, some people only remember the name of the guy who took you on that near-fatal voyage around the world, assuming you survive. Payden Harley asks, Friedman's US battleships quotes a World War I-era Royal Navy report on US Navy practices. The report notes, the greater extent of space given to workshops and the larger extent of repairs carried out in American ships versus Royal Navy ships. The report attributes this priority of the US Navy to the experience of the Great White Fleet and the lack of US Navy overseas bases. Was there still a difference between the US Navy and Royal Navy in World War II? What were the capabilities of the onboard workshops and machine shops? Were they limited to fabricating small parts? And why devote space and weight to heavy machine tools and the crew needed to operate them rather than just carry spares? Well, indeed, here is the machine shop on USS North Carolina and a pretty, well, part of it at least, and a pretty impressive setup it is as well. Now, in terms of what they're limited to doing, there's some pretty serious industrial milling and lathe machines that here, so it, I suppose it depends what you mean by fabricating small parts one of the critical things is you know there's not a forge or heat treatment facility so you're not going to be replacing gun barrels um or the more serious bits of armor plate things like that but general machine parts cogs gears um small bits of plate tools individual elements so firing pins that kind of thing all of that could definitely be done, and some fairly hefty weight stuff as well. I I would anticipate you know, anything up to and including stuff you might struggle to carry with one man could probably all be produced, at least in this battleship's workshop. But as I say, they, they don't really have any kind of extensive facilities for heat treatment and that kind of thing, at least as far as I could see. So those kinds of things would be off the table. And of course, things like propeller shafts, large-scale armor plate, uh, bulkhead doors, that kind of thing. That's that's too large a scale for at least the tools that, that I saw. Um, in terms of why devote space and weight to these tools rather than carry spares, well, the problem is there are a lot of different components on a ship, and some of those components might only exist in certain places, so it might be, okay, well, you know, if there's only... I don't know, six of this particular kind of machine and this particular element of it breaks every so often. Well, if we carry two dozen, that might fit in a single box that we can store in a compartment somewhere. That's absolutely fine. 
but when you might be having, I don't know, 70 or 80 orlicans, or some kind of fairly basic machine or fitting that exists in the hundreds or thousands across the ship or with the orlicans, you know, specific components, which there might, you might therefore have, you know, 80 to 160 of those particular type of component in service at any one time. If you're going to carry multiple spares for each of those, all of a sudden that adds up to a huge amount of space. And then that's only one particular type of fitting. Multiply that by all the fittings that are likely to possibly need a spare parts and replacements. And you very quite quickly end up with a stock of spares that A, would probably take up more space and more weight than the machine shop would. And B, obviously, the vast majority of it would probably not be used in any one particular voyage. Well, now, whilst obviously you would carry some spares, for all the for smaller bits and pieces, it actually makes more sense to have these machine shops, because not only can you turn out spares for bits and pieces on your own ship, you can also, if you've got the specs and the crew, turn out spares for other ships in the fleet. So, you know, if a destroyer radios in, it's like, uh, some, like I don't know, but the, um, the crank handle for one of my 40 mils is broken you can probably manufacture a new one on the battleship, or at least a facsimile that's close enough to, to do the job. Um, and, you know, little bits and pieces, various tools and such that the crew might be using. And it means that if you also have to jury rig something, so if, you know, like, well, this is broken and this is broken, and maybe we can't replace this because this has a uh, specific heat treatment on it, or it's too complex or too large for us to do, well, maybe we can make this and this and put this together and it's not orthodox but it works and so with the machine shop you can make these jury rig components as well so overall it is actually a a space and weight saving utility and yeah i can i mean obviously the there aren't any preserved royal navy battleships to compare the machine shop size to and as you've seen from the tour that i did of hms belfast hms belfast machine shop is fairly extensive it's not as extensive as North Carolina's, but then North Carolina outmasses Belfast by a factor of three and a half to four times, so that's not exactly surprising. I suspect that the machine shop facilities on Royal Navy warships by World War II had probably expanded somewhat because they didn't have the sheer numbers and of ships and complete plethora of overseas bases that were completely well stocked that they had had in the run up to World War One. But I would also suspect that the U.S. Navy machine shops were probably still slightly larger, if for no other reason than, you know, the Royal Navy still did have access to a fair number of overseas bases that had stocks of spares and supplies, whereas the U.S. Navy was still faced with a perennial problem of trans-Pacific voyages with, you know, unless you're heading for Pearl, nothing really else do that you could do if something broke mid-ocean. Mid Plus, the other thing you've got to bear in mind is that it's probably actually cheaper to get your crew to knock out spare parts for things because you've got this one-time cost in the machine plant and all the tooling on the ship, and then you train the crew, and then the crew are getting paid anyway for being on the ship. So at that point, you've effectively got, not quite free, but near enough for the purposes of this argument, free labour to manufacture all these spare parts and then all you've got to stock is the raw materials you know brass and steel tube is probably a lot 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 cheaper than the things that those can be eventually be made into as opposed to having to buy all the finished products which would cost a lot more uh, especially if you're obviously doing regular replacements of things gabriel a hawkins asks Filing this question under item number 17 that I do not like about the Issei conversions, but when carrier operations begin, they typically turn the carrier into the wind. How did that work with a converted Issei? Not to put too fine a point on it, but it seems like a plane taking off would have a notable problem of a funnel in its way. Did the planes take off backwards, i.e. in the opposite direction that the ship was sailing? So one of the problems with the Issei's was simply that the flight deck, such as it was, was too short. You, know, you couldn't actually conventionally take off or land anything on it. It had a series of catapults and catapult arms, and to be fair to it, I mean, the you've got the funnel there, but you've also got this superstructure even further after the funnel, 
but with the catapults you could if not launch the aircraft directly ahead of you, you could actually get pretty close to it. Um, and so if the ship was sailing into the wind, but maybe a few degrees off of directly into the wind, you'd get direct wind flow over whichever catapult you were therefore slightly exposing, or you could just sail dead on into the wind and you'd just get the wind at a slight off angle, but probably not enough to make any real difference. The catapult obviously doing a huge amount of leg working get getting the aircraft up to the appropriate speed um so yeah that's how in theory it would work uh then you've got to worry about getting the aircraft back which is another matter if you launch float planes then fine you well this is the wonderful thing of if you launch float planes you can probably get them back if they survive but being float planes the chances of them actually surviving are not particularly brilliant uh, whereas if you launched uh conventional aircraft that had just been rigged for catapult launch dive bombers fighters etc then you can't get them back you can launch them you can launch maybe up to two dozen aircraft but and you know some more of them might survive if you're not using uh float planes but then those conventional aircraft to say they can't recover back to your flight deck so they'd have you'd either have to have a land base nearby or you'd have to have an a carrier nearby which is you know not particularly great which is why as i say when if the east as i've said before using the east as fighter carriers they'd basically be one shot and done carriers for intercepting incoming enemy airstrikes because to be perfectly fair so by the time you send up an isay or hugo sized cap to intercept an incoming american strike between them and the CAP from the conventional carriers, you're probably going to lose enough fighters that it doesn't really matter if all the surviving fighters recover back to the conventional carriers. They'll have room. <laughs> and if they don't, then they can transfer them back to you overnight. October Nid asks, a bit to the end of the channel, but in the end, what was more lethal to the battleship? Air power or victory? in that by 1946 the only true top shelf examples were all left on the same side iowa's vanguard richelieu's even goben eventually given that in the u.s navy anti-aircraft fire drove the japanese to adopt kamikaze tactics in the first place how much of the dominance of air power was due to the anti-aircraft that the u.s navy was facing at not being much more than mediocre and if anti-aircraft technology had been a bit more equal would there have been a better case for longer service from big gun ships? Uh, what if the Russians somehow acquired and dragged Nagato into a Russian yard and refitted her, or they'd actually gotten the Latoria they'd wanted? Would the NATO navies have felt the need to keep more counters to them around? Basically, did battleships run out of use, or did they run out of targets? I think it's a mixture of the two. Uh, one of the arguments for keeping Vanguard around for a while was to kill Sverdlovs, and then the Royal Navy concluded that they could probably run two cruisers for the price of a single Vanguard, and two cruisers could be in two places at the same time, whereas Vanguard could only be in one place at once, and they reckoned their cruisers could kill Sverdlovs just as easily as Vanguard could, for a relative value thereof, and so Vanguard went to the breakers. Now, if the Russians had actually got a capital ship of their own, either as you say, a Latorio, or maybe if they'd completed a Sovetsky Soyuz, well, yeah, at that point you can't really argue that a town or crown colony class cruiser is going to defeat a Russian battleship, at which point there would be much more of an argument for keeping Vanguard around. And so, yeah, if if the enemy, quote-unquote, i.e. basically the USSR-Warsaw Pact, had their own capital ships in terms of you know all big gun battleships then yes they probably would have kept battleships around in the various nato nations for considerably longer but equally whilst the japanese air power had been broken by the end of world war Two, at the same time there were a lot of weapons that were being developed. So by the end of World War II, apart from having a cap far enough forward to shoot down the incoming bombers, the Allied navies didn't have that many counters to the German guided weapons. Uh, you basically had to take out the launch platform, and since the launch platform was beyond the range of most AA, you either had to rely on 
some of the longer range AA that was in the fleet and things like the 5.25s from the British, uh, which was why there was so much interest in dual purpose six inch amongst other things or aircraft to take out those launch platforms because all the 20 and 40 mil in the world wasn't going to help you take out, you know, Dornier 217 that was 10, 15 miles away. And the Western allies were developing similar weapons of their own and even more destructive weapons of their own. And they had assumed partly from the fact they knew the Russians had captured a bunch of German scientists and technology and partly from, you know, just the generally good principle that assume your enemy is at least as good as you, they assumed that the Russians would soon have similar weapons. So the battleship was just as vulnerable to what they were thinking was going to be a, a sort of a night, late 40s, early 50s anti-shipping weapon as a destroyer or a cruiser. All the armour in the world, as had been proven by things like Fritz X, probably wasn't going to save you, and studies showed like with the 1945 Royal Navy battleship, you'd need a truly absurd vessel to make it make it such that the armour was actually worth something. So it's six or one and a half dozen of the other. If if there had been other targets that would have been very difficult to crack, um, given, especially given that obviously well into the 40s and 50s, the vast majority, although Night Strike capable aircraft did exist, the vast majority of strike aircraft in the NATO arsenal were still daytime, i.e. fair weather only, and therefore you couldn't rely on them all the time. So yeah, other heavily armoured targets might well have kept battleships around for long for longer, but the big heavy anti-shipping weapons that were both already in service by the end of World War II and even worse beginning to come into service in the 40s and 50s, or anticipated there and too, really also did sign a bit of the death knell for the battleship. Christopher Dent asks, has a group of capital ships ever combined their reconnaissance float planes into a makeshift air group and constructed an airstrike in a fashion we more typically see from carrier-based aircraft? Not as such. There are just not enough of them and their carrying capacity is generally not particularly large. In terms of groups of ships combining aircraft when they're not aircraft carriers to form a strike group that has happened in world war one a number of the royal navy air raids on various german targets were done in this manner with things like little lighters that were towed behind destroyers and such so the strike was made up of lots of individual smaller ships most of whom were not either aircraft or seaplane carriers all combining to launch aircraft that they were towing or carrying as well as a small core group from a carrier of some description. So there's that. And there's also, to a certain degree, the ostensible plans for air defence in the latter part of World War One and the immediate aftermath thereof until you know full-scale through-deck carrier conversions were accomplished. And that involved having a bunch of aircraft... Well... On, on hood, as you can see, this is mounted on the tail in, in this at that in during the, the time period that this was, photo was taken. But um, when you look at the Grand Fleet, for example, by the end of the war, they had a reasonable number of fighters, you know, through two, two to four aircraft, usually stop with one and a halfs, um, all mounted on catapults over various turrets. Now, you weren't going to necessarily get them back, it was very much a one shot and done deal, but the kind of collective air defence for the Grand Fleet at that point consisted of everybody launching an aircraft or two off if it was felt absolutely necessary. And then collectively, you actually had a somewhat worrying 150-plus aircraft who could, in theory, fight any incoming threat. Of course, as I said, once you've done that, you then had no air, real air defence unless you happened to have a spare aircraft or two sitting around on the ship because the ones that you launched were going to have to ditch... But as a single-use screen or a series of smaller screens, it was vaguely effective, at least potentially, against you know the the late the latest and greatest threats of the time. It wouldn't be a anywhere close to as effective later on in World War Two when they didn't try it because they knew it wouldn't be effective. But in World War One, when everyone was moving around in slow biplanes or zeppelins, then you kind of had a 
a certain merit to it when you didn't have a full-size carrier with you. Robert Olweiler asks, could you run through a set of fire control calculations for a moving battleship firing at a moving target at a range of 20,000 yards and explain the variables, corrections, etc.? Also, I toured the USS Iowa recently, and the guide said that the US Navy was the only Navy with fire control computers that could correct for the ship carrying them manoeuvring without having to recalculate all the values, stating that this was a massive advantage. Is there veracity to this claim? Well, <laughs> for the fire control calculations, I think at that point I have to recommend my video on fire control because, I, well, it's over an hour and I go through the main issues um, in terms of the var the variables and so forth, and it takes an hour. So, you know, it's not an exhaustive in-depth thing and, and still. So <laughs> I'd recommend going to watch that video for the answer to the first part of the question. Um, in terms of the second part of the question, now there, there's a couple of caveats. One, not all fire control computers are created equal. So the capabilities of one US ship are going to be different to the capabilities of another US ship, depending on how many and what type of fire control computers they've been fitted with. So it, yes, certain US ships did have fire control computers like this, which you can see here, which I saw on the trip. Now, those can do, as you say, correct for the ship that you're on maneuvering without having to stop and re-input everything and recalculate everything. But they're not on every single US ship that happens to have a gun in the fleet. The other thing is also, what time period are you talking about? Because at the very beginning of World War II, i.e. 1939, 1940, US fire control systems like the Mark I and the Mark VIII, etc., were not particularly widespread if at all in the fleet they were beginning to be distributed but um you know some of the systems that you can see here weren't even invented in 1939 let alone deployed um and then of course by the time you get to 1942 which is the middle of world war ii for most people then yeah at that point the u.s does have a fair advantage over pretty much everybody else because they have these systems in place and then as you get towards the end of the war other nations start to catch up again. So, for example, the Admiralty Fire Control Table Mark 10, uh, which is found on HMS Vanguard, that is just as capable of keeping up with a manoeuvring target as the systems on an Iowa or a South, or a South Dakota. But, obviously, the Vanguard isn't actually brought into service until after World War II. So you've got varying degrees of, say for the British Admiralty Fire Control Table Mark 10, that have varying degrees of capability. So, yeah, I, for the part of World War II that the US Navy is actually involved in, which is 42 onwards, they do have a degree of advantage in their fire control in certain situations. Um, depending on exactly which ship you're talking about. If you're talking about battleships, then yes, generally they have a degree of advantage, but it is only a degree. It, it A lot more will depend on the precise situation. You know, do they have radar or not? Is the radar working? What kind of radar have they got? That is probably going to make much more of a difference than the specifics of a particular fire control system. Um, but assuming that both sides can see the other then yes, US ships would usually have a, an advantage in what their fire control systems could deliver versus what most likely opponents' fire control systems could deliver uh, in terms of keeping gun accuracy whilst manoeuvring. With the caveat, of course, that there's only a limited amount the, of manoeuvring that you can do with some of the earlier systems before they, what, they won't really um, work too well or give you accurate enough solutions. And that's one of the wonderful, as I say, that is one of the wonderful things about these systems. You literally have expansion ports. You can see some of them there, the plates on the side, you, which are normally used for inspection. You can see at the back there another unit, which it's literally, as opposed to, you know, with software where you download an update uh, or you might swap out a graphics card, with these old fire control systems, as newer 
additions and extra features and more capabilities came into effect, it was literally unbolt some of these plates, attach an entire physical upgrade segment, and now your overall system is much, much more efficient. So I guess that's a very long way of saying, in broad strokes, the guide is correct, but it's not a universal gospel truth across the entirety of 1939 to 1945. You have to be somewhat more scenario-specific if you want to establish exactly who's got what advantage and where. David de Boer asks, Your upcoming visit to Yorktown got me thinking about ships serving in the same war as the previous ship to bear the name. For example, the Essex-class versions of Yorktown, Lexington, Hornet and Wasp, as well as various US cruisers, were able to serve in World War II, the same war that saw the loss of their predecessors. Was this practice of reviving a ship's name within the same war used by other countries? And were there many other wars to see this occur? Yes, in any longish war, i.e. a war that lasts long enough to actually build a new ship or complete a ship that was partway through building, where a country has a major navy, you generally do tend to see this kind of thing happening. I mean, the Japanese were, they had the carrier Amagi, they just about completed the Unryu-class Amagi, technically speaking, by the time the war ended. Uh, you can see in this picture HMS Gurkha, not the tribal class. The tribal class HMS Gurkha was sunk relatively early in the war, at which point an L-class destroyer was renamed HMS Gurkha. And then, as you can guess from this picture, it was sunk 11 months after it was commissioned. At the Royal Navy kind of took the hint and they didn't name any further ships HMS Gurkha for the duration of that conflict, although there was one after the war. Um, you Obviously, you've cited some of the American examples but you also had, say, in uh, World War I, the Imperial German Navy named a whole bunch of cruisers that it built after a bunch of w uh, cruisers that had been sunk earlier in the war. So there's multiple Karlsruhe's, there's multiple Emden's in the Kaiserliche Marina in World War I, which is really unhelpful sometimes if you get a picture. It's like, hang on. This says Karlsruhe in 1915. It comes from it was sunk. Oh no, it's the other Karlsruhe. Right. Okay, gotcha. In the Age of Sail, during the Napoleonic Wars, the French had two separate ships called Tonon during the conflict, one of which was captured, and then another one took over the name. And uh, again, in the same conflict, there were actually, on, on the flip side, as I've pointed out at Trafalgar, there was the HMS Swiftshire in Nelson's column. Oh, or Nelson's fleet, sorry. But that was a replacement for the Swiftsher that had been captured by the French earlier. And that Swiftsher was actually <laughs> in the Franco-Spanish fleet. So there were two Swiftsher's um, originally built both by the Royal Navy in the same battle on opposite sides. Atomic Bretonic asks, Just how survivable was a battleship if a shell managed to bypass the armour and nothing like a magazine exploded? And in the case of a magazine explosion or boiler cooking off what are their countermeasures to fight the results of that catastrophe in the event that a shell bypassed the armor but didn't penetrate and set off a magazine or flood an engineering space or something like that which would be fairly difficult considering that's basically what the armor was protecting but anyway it was entirely possible for a ship to continue surviving that the the main thing if the machinery space hasn't flooded and uh the magazines aren't under threat is how much water has this hole admitted to the ship and is it continuing to do so i.e is it a, a water line hit a below water line hit or an above water line hit near the water line or just well above the water line uh or is it indeed a hit that's just hit the ship generally i.e not not bypassed any particular degree of armor so, generally speaking, it was estimated pretty much universally, actually, across all navies, that in the event of a non-catastrophic hit, i.e. You know, not lighting off a magazine or flooding a major engineering space, it should take about 20 to 25 hits, depending on exactly which navy you're talking about. But most people estimated somewhere within the range of 20 to 25 hits to immobilize a capital ship. And when I say immobilize, I don't mean like physically bring it to a halt. I mean, render it incapable of further combat service. 
assuming that you didn't cause something catastrophic with one of those penetrations. So that's kind of your rough guide for survivability in the event of non-critical damage. If a magazine exploded or a boiler cooked off, were there countermeasures? If a boiler cooked off, there were, because on a capital ship you'd have multiple engineering spaces. Ideally, you'd have m your boiler rooms and your uh, engine rooms separated off completely. In some ships, due to circumstances, you'd have machinery spaces, so you'd have your boiler and engine pair in the same room. But even in the worst case, assuming that the boiler explosion isn't absolutely catastrophic in and of itself, you'd lose a machinery space or a boiler room, which at that point you'd lose, unless you've got a turbo electric drive, you'd lose that shaft. But the ship could still continue on, depending on how many screws you have, two, possibly three screws. So there were countermeasures to fight the results of that kind of catastrophe. If a magazine explodes, on the other hand, on a battleship, if it's a secondary battery magazine, you could probably, depending on the ship and depending on the location of the magazine, you might be able to live with that. It would cause major damage, and the ship probably have to retire from battle, but you could put in extreme damage control measures, obviously, you know, section off the area, play lots of water onto it, and you might survive. But if the main magazines cook off on a battleship, I'm sorry, that's it. You're, you're dead, basically. There, there is no countermeasure to your main magazines cooking off on a battleship. Stephen Perry asks, What are your thoughts on the ship of Theseus, and what type of refit or rebuild would constitute a new ship? For instance, is the Brig Niagara the same ship, or a replica. So the idea of the ship of Theseus concept, for those of you who haven't heard of it before, is that, well, it's taken obviously from Greek legend, but the idea is you've, if you've got a ship and then you keep replacing bits of it as they get rotten or worn away, eventually you're going to have ended up replacing every single original component of the ship and then probably replacing the replacements at which point the dilemma is, is that still the same ship? Or is it just a very, very slow replacement? Now, you know, that's typical Greek philosophy for you, but never mind. Um, in terms of the Niagara, I'd say she's right on the line. For me personally, she's probably just a little bit on the rep just fractionally over onto the replica side of things and obviously you feel free to look up her history but basically the Niagara has been sunk um fished back out repaired rotted repaired rotted <laughs> rebuilt um to the point that although she looks like uh, the Niagara did back in in the day there's basically only a few scattered non-structural bits of the original ship within that ship. And the reason I say she's probably just about on the replica side for me is because A, one, A, not really a tremendous amount of original components, and B, they, the, they were all done as part of a, a rebuild for the ship being a museum, and they weren't done with the ship being in active service. And C, when she was rebuilt, it was very much, we are building a ship, we're including some extra bits from, you know, some bits and pieces from the old ship. It wasn't, you know, we're taking a plank off the ship and replacing it with a new one. So that's kind of why I think she's just just on the replica side of things, um, but with some continuity to the original vessel. Now, the, as you might guess from that, my general consideration for is this a ship of Theseus or a new ship, or is it, you know, is it the original ship? in some way, shape, or form, would be based on three things. One, how much of the ship is original? So you can look at something like USS Constitution or HMS Victory, you know, how much of the ship is still there from the original time period. Um, if there's a higher percentage, then that, to me, lends more towards a repaired original rather than a replica. And therein lies another issue for me, which is, which parts of the ship have you replaced? Because in active service, would you expect to be replacing certain components? So on a wooden ship, yeah, 
during its lifetime in active service, both Victory and Constitution would have had their outer planking replaced at periods, it's still the same ship. So post becoming a museum ship, if they've had extensive refits where their outer planking, etc., has been replaced, well, that's kind of just par for the course of repairs. So uh, that that would lend it towards still being the same ship. Whereas if you've taken out like the keel and made significant portions of the framework, that is kind of a core part of the ship, which in its active service would not ex- you'd not expect to be re- replaced. At which point, it's uh, urging verging more on the being a replica than a actual original. Um, secondly, is when parts are replaced, does the ship continue in active service? So you think about some of the modernizations, like the modernization of USS West Virginia, Conte de Cavour, War Spite, etc. They're very, very different ships once they come out of the modernization. A lot of the old stuff's been discarded, a lot of new stuff's been put in, but generally everyone acknowledges they're still the same vessel. And that's because they continue in service. There is a continuity of, you know, use of the vessel so i think that that definitely is a fact you know if the ship has a 10 20 30 40 years lifespan and then it goes out of service the fact that it might look completely different from how it looked on the day that it was commissioned is somewhat irrelevant because it's it is the ship and if you preserve the ship in the manner that it was when it was decommissioned that's no less valid a candidate for being the ship as you know, someone who takes another ship and restores it back to its original condition. In fact, in some ways, you could say, depending on the degree of restoration, if you're using new components or components sourced from other ships, you might actually be making that ship less authentic than the re- refitted one. Um, whereas when you're talking about mu- once the ship is static in a museum and you're just replacing parts after parts after parts, um, I think again this is just a personal thing but for me that tends to start drifting more from what the ship originally was because it's no longer using those parts as as part of its role as a ship and i think the other thing for me when it comes to is this an actual ship or a replica is at what scale and speed have these changes occurred because i mean this is the sort of going back to the original greek dilemma with the ship of theseus if you replace a plank a year in the in the ship, eventually you will end up with a ship that contains no original parts, but the change was not particularly large at any given time. Now, in those circumstances, I would argue that actually you might as well call it the same, because if it's the, again, without replacing the major structural components in, en masse, but if you're doing little repairs here and there where portions of the ship are being replaced and then years later other portions of the ship are being replaced there's i think there's more of a continuity to that than there is in basically just building or refitting an entire ship pretty much from the ground up and just happening to use some components from the older ship those are two very very different things in my book so in some ways you could argue if you want to say replace 80 percent of the ship's outer planking if you do that all in one go I'd start to think more about this is a replacement vessel. Maybe maybe not go all the way there, but I'd start to think more in that direction. Whereas if you, ha- you replace the same amount of timber over the course of, say, 30 years, I'd be much more inclined to think of it as, broadly speaking, still continuity as the original ship, quote-unquote. Gregory Albert asks, What carrier, carrier conversion, light carrier, escort carrier, etc., was a match for Bairn. Well, what happens when you look at Bairn's capabilities? She's basically incredibly slow for a carrier, 21, 22 knots. Um, so she's battleship speed, uh, and World War One battleship speed at that. Uh, she carries just over 30 aircraft. That's really all you need to know about the ship, because you know, gun armament is somewhat irrelevant um armor protection again as a carrier if you're using your armor protection or your surface guns something's already gone horribly wrong so compare that against everybody else's well almost everyone's first carriers and second third carriers either have 
more aircraft, or if they've got similar air groups, they're faster. I mean, even Eagle was 24 and a half ish knots, so could make a reasonable turn of speed. Hermes, 25 knots. The only carrier which was probably slightly less capable uh, in terms of the first gen carriers would have been Langley. And even then, Langley's got con comparable air group capability, but at 15 knots, she is even more catastrophically slow. Um, ben is slightly better than poor old Argus. They're of a roughly similar speed, but Argus can only carry about half as many aircraft, so I guess there's that. But in terms of what Bayern actually matches up against, at least by World War II, you're probably looking at a Sangamon class carrier because they have similar air groups, like just over 30 aircraft are pushing it, similar speeds. Bayern is, okay, a fraction faster, but the Sangamons are, you know, within a couple of two, three knots speed difference. So they can operate a similar air group at roughly a similar speed. Um, that's basically what Bayern is the equivalent of, um, except the Bayern is a lot more expensive and uh, complex to run than an escort carrier. Jack Devaney asks, I was listening to Sabaton's new World War One album, and specifically the song Dreadnought, and would like your opinion on whether there is any truth to the chorus and the Dreadnought dread nothing at all. Was this true? In their heyday, it's broadly accurate, actually. I think there's a Admiral Fisher quote which runs along something along the lines of a modern dreadnought fears nothing but God and another of its own kind, um, which is typical Fisher, but actually pretty darn accurate. Um, you know, 1900s, 1910s, yes, of course, battleships could be sunk by mines like HMS Audacious, they could be sunk by torpedoes occasionally, but you know, a well fought battleship in a, the heart of a fleet really didn't have anything to fear other than other dreadnoughts, uh, which, I mean, is technically that's a step down from dreading nothing at all. But when you get enough of them together, they really don't fear anything. Uh, and this is a, perhaps one of the underappreciated parts of Jutland. Now, obviously, technically, battle cruisers are dreadnought armoured cruisers, so it didn't work out particularly well for BT. But going into the Battle of Jutland, the Royal Navy had a huge, almost overwhelming amount of confidence that they were going to carry the day, regardless of pretty much anything else. And as I say, Battlecruiser Fleet, maybe not quite so founded in accurate hope, but when it came to the Grand Fleet, you can kind of see where they were coming from. They had an absolutely overwhelming superiority in numbers and firepower, there was no other fleet on the planet that could challenge them in a straight-up fight. And the Germans kind of agreed. Because when you think about it, you know, think back to the vast majority of the big naval battles, whether it be, um, you know, Trafalgar, whether it be Salamis or the Armada, various Anglo-Dutch wars, Lepanto, etc. In a lot of cases, you can go at and look at those fleets and look at them on paper and see where the firepower advantage lies, where that term is applicable. And you can make an argument, OK, maybe one side or the other should have realised going into it that they were probably going to lose. And in a fair number of cases, a lot of the time... One side went into it pretty certain they were going to lose, but they were either stubborn enough or they thought there was a near enough margin of victory that they thought, actually, you know what, we're going to go and try for, for this anyway, either for honour, because it's worth it, or because we might, we might manage to scrape a victory out of this, or at least a decent draw. Jutland is one of the very, 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 very few major battles, and certainly the largest major naval battle where upon actually sighting the other side's main force one side just takes one look at it and goes stuff this we're out of here um <laughs> you know for, for for all the other talk you might say at jutland 
that line of British dreadnoughts that made up the Grand Fleet managed to scare the High Seas Fleet into just going, nope, we're out. This is this is not even worth attempting. Um, at which point, yeah, you know, the sailors aboard the Grand Fleet's battle line, they really didn't have anything to dread at all because they could quite literally scare their biggest opponent into running away from them simply by existing. And a related question, uh, Slam and Sam asks... Listening to Sabaton's song Wolfpack, the lyrics describe the attack of Wolfpack Hecht on Convoy own N92. I was wondering, one, how accurate are the lyrics to the events that transpired? And two, I was hoping for a bit of background on early American convoy escorts around 1942. Well, I mean, obviously there's a limited amount of information that they can include in a song that you know lasts less than five minutes and has to have a chorus. Um, but, broadly speaking, most of what's in the song is accurate as far as it goes um about the only thing listening to it that i could find any fault with is um at one point there's a line which says bury is in in standing in flames um i don't know quite what they're referencing at that point if if they're referencing the ship having to sail through the flaming fuel of a ship that was sunk in order to rescue survivors then that that would be on point because that was the kind of thing that rescue ships, which Bury was, and it would end up having to do several times. If they're talking about Bury itself being in flames, uh, and then as far as I'm aware, Bury wasn't hit. Um, she definitely wasn't sunk during that. But so I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt and assume that they meant the first one. In which case, it's perfectly fine. Um, it doesn't mention all of the escorts. I mention uh, Gleaves and Ingham, uh, the two main escorts, to be fair. Uh, but there were four flower class corvettes in the escort group as well one from the royal navy and three from the royal canadian navy so you know there are a few more escorts but they've picked on the main ones the lead ships so okay that's all fair enough um i mean bro broadly speaking to be honest when sabaton do a song about a specific historic event it's usually pretty pretty much spot on uh, I'm not the world's biggest fan of the Bismarck one, but then it's. <laughs> um, I, I, I would I would put Bismarck in the category of the ones which are generally about a subject rather than specifically about a particular event, um, and that way the continuity is maintained. And so when it comes to early American convoy escorts in 1942, at least as far as the North Atlantic's concerned. It's a bit of a mixed bag because obviously Americans have been brought into the war by Japan's attack on it. So the vast majority of America's naval strength is being funneled into the Pacific to shore up the situation there. So what you get in the Atlantic is this slightly odd hodgepodge of a few fleet destroyers um, like the Gleaves. A bunch of U.S. Coast Guard cutters, at least the more ocean-going ones, um, and as 1942 progresses, also a random collection of vague anti-sub-like escorts that had been built in the First World War and where they were still in mothballs or storage, they were being brought back out. Um, plus, of course, as time went on, older ships that were being brought out of um, mothballs uh, that were more ocean-going. And then up close on the coast, for eventually you had some um, some converted civilian vessels, but mostly a bunch of short-range, again, kind of vessels brought out of mothballs and so forth. The U.S. Navy's anti-sub escort force wasn't tremendously large outside of you know the fleet destroyers that served dual per three, two or three purposes, um, and most of those were in the Pacific. So. Yeah, um, it, it's a very scattershot group of ships. You know, you, you see one formation of US ships running convoy escort uh, on one convoy. The next time you see a US formation sharing convoy escort duties in the Atlantic in 1942, it's going to be probably made up of a completely different balance of shipping. But towards the end of the year, and then obviously going into 43, as you start to get um, both transfers of escort ships and the U.S. building its own dedicated escort ships, things start to even out considerably more. Uh, it's something that, if Dash, when I ever get round to covering the Battle of the Atlantic in detail, will probably need to be explored in a lot more depth.
Clerdic asks, in Jane's Fighting Ships 1914 and Brer's Battleships and Battle Cruises 1973 English edition, they give the original name for the sister to USS Pennsylvania as the USS North Carolina. We know this ship, of course, as the Arizona. Arizona became a state on February the 14th, 1912, but I cannot find a date when BB-39 was authorised. Can you help out? This might also be a good time to discuss the period when US armoured cruisers had their names changed to provide names for new battleships. So, to address the second part, yes, a bunch of US armoured cruisers that had been constructed in the early 1900s had taken on state names because, well, at the time, they were big. The combat doctrine still kind of held that maybe they could have a useful role is secondary ships in the battle line. Tsushima certainly seemed to have suggested that to a degree. And so you had the Pennsylvania class armored cruisers, Tennessee class armored cruisers, as the name suggests, carrying state names. And then when the policy shifted to be only battleships carry state names and the US started building a fair number of them, then those ships gradually began to lose their state names and were renamed to other things to free up their names for use on other ships. Now, when it comes to the Pennsylvania class, you have to keep in mind effectively four important dates. June 1911 is when the original call for designs that would become the Pennsylvania is put out. January 1912 is when the preliminary designs are actually submitted. Then August 1912 is when Pennsylvania is authorised because at the time uh, Congress was only going to authorise a single battleship. And then March 1913 is when the battleship USS Arizona, BB-39, is authorised by Congress to be built. So if there was originally a plan to name the second Pennsylvania class USS North Carolina, it can't have been a very long-lived one. Uh, apart from anything else, actually related to your other part of the question about the armored cruisers there was a armored cruiser uss north carolina but by all records it seems that she remained uss north carolina until a south dakota class battleship was going to be named uss north carolina whereas if there was a serious ongoing in um idea to try and re uh, to name bb39 as north carolina they probably would have removed the name from the armored cruiser earlier now there does seem to have been some speculation at the time that bb39 was laid down that she'd be named north carolina but i can't particularly seem to fathom why the only thing that i can come up with is when i look at the u.s states and arrange them by order of ratification or admission i.e how old the state is within the united states and then you list off all the names. You've got Delaware, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Georgia, Connecticut, Massachusetts, Maryland, South Carolina, New Hampshire, Virginia, New York, and then North Carolina. Every other state that precedes North Carolina on that list already had a battleship either in service or building that carried that state's name. And North Carolina is just the first one that didn't have an active battleship in service. So I guess maybe they speculated based on that. Um, that's about as close as I can come at this point. The, the inner workings of US political decisions when it comes to ship naming are usually a little beyond me. Kevin Weber asks, can you talk about range finding smoke shells? Who invented or first used them? And did all navies use them? As I've only explicitly heard about the Japanese and how often they were used. I, did they keep using them until the range was found or once every four rounds or something like that? Were there different colours used for different guns on a single ship? And were they any less damaging when they actually hit? I've not seen any particular reference made in the early 20th century to range finding smoke shells. Smoke shells did exist on ships, but they were pretty much near exclusively restricted to smaller calibre guns, anything up to six inch, but usually smaller still, sometimes found on mortars and stuff. But even then, they were relatively rare unless the ship was going into a shore bombardment mission. The vast majority of the time, smoke aboard ships was generated by either playing around with the air fuel mix in the boilers and funnels or 
by using smoke floats and other generators. That's not to say smoke shells didn't exist, but say they were for the smaller calibre guns and in relatively sparse quantities. From the fact you're mentioning different colours and range finding, and especially, you know, mo the most common commonly mentioned nation using them is the Japanese, I think what you're referring to is dye shells. Um, well, there's one here, for example, this one is red. Um, and those were used for range finding, where you had a dye packet which would be blown up with the shell, which would then stain the water. And these were brought in, uh, the Japanese especially were quite fond of using them, as many American ships found out at the Battle of Samar. But they were also issued in the interwar period to the French Navy, the British, the Americans, etc., etc. Um, it's just that by the time you get well stuck into World War II, well, one of the main points of the dye shells was to help distinguish the shell splashes of different ships because that had been a problem in World War One in big fleet engagements. And, well, by World War II, there weren't that many big fleet engagements, at least on a capital ship level. So, you know, you didn't need them because if you're only fighting with one or two capital ships at any one time, it's fairly easy to tell whose shell splashes are whose, you'd think at least. Uh, plus, of course, radar range finding was coming in, which obviated the need for the um, die shells, because the radar, once it had gotten up to a certain point, could actually track the shells going in, which you know also helped, <laughs> um, and meant you didn't need to visually spot necessarily. Whereas the Japanese, they stuck with the die shells partly obviously because they didn't have range finding radar for the vast majority of the war. And also they were a lot more liberal in their use of die shells. So they had die shells equipped to their heavy cruisers as well as their capital ships. They didn't do any less damage if they hit you. Um, it just meant that if you were hit, you'd also be brightly coloured as well as blown up. Fisher, fishers, fishing, fisher, fishing for freshly fished, fresh fish for fish fry Friday, asks... Can you show how the turrets of capital ships are assembled? How could massive pieces of armour be attached to each other before welding was a thing? Once again, the caveat that exact details varied by time and navy, but generally speaking, at least for most of the turrets you're probably interested in, i.e. World War I, World War II, you would start off by building a framework, it looks almost like a wireframe except in steel, and then typically... This would be overlaid by a thin sheeting of construction grade steel. Sometimes this wouldn't be done, sometimes it might just be the armour plating straight on, but commonly a thin sheeting of whatever you were using as general hull steel would be put on to form a gun house. And then the armour plating would be attached to that. Now, once welding came in, of course, you could weld together the uh, hull grade steel that you were using to build the inner gun house but if you wanted to attach the armor plate to the tu turret frame or the turret shell depending as I said on which construction technique you're using you would just use rivets if the armor was thin enough so it might be roof armor or rear turret armor maybe side armor depending on the turret you could run a rivet straight through especially if that armor was homogenous armor rather than face hardened armor and whether or not you used face hardened or homogenous armor in a turret for its protection again depends on the time depends on the navy and in some cases also depends on the facing of the turret um so if you're talking about thinner plates of homogenous armor it's simple just rivet it all together if you're talking about thicker plates of homogenous armor well then you start to have some issues getting a rivet all the way through and face hardened obviously it's very difficult to get a bolt through that um, you can do it you can locally heat up and ruin the heat treatment around the site of where you're going to put the bolt but to be perfectly honest in the vast majority of cases if you have you know a double digit thickness of face hardened armor plate the chances of you successfully using and drilling out the holes for you know, 16 18 20 inch bolts or rivets is relatively low it's very very time consuming so in those cases because very much the face hard armor is hard on the outside but not the inside quite often what will be done is the rivets or bolts would be sunk in from the interior so they'd be you'd be attaching the plate to the frame or the shell 
via a bolt that runs into the softer metal behind at the back end of the face hardened armor and if you had massive amounts of homogenous armor as well uh, like say us class b then quite often they'd also do that so the bolts would just be screwed in from behind which then from the outside can give the impression that there's nothing holding it together um because you can't see any bolt lines and there's usually not that many visible weld lines either so you're like well how how is this being held together there's maybe some sealant or some very very m m sort of, well, minuscule very light surface welds just to keep water from getting into the joints and that's usually as I said because there's bolts holding it all together internally and then those bolts have to be capped so that they don't just go flying off if the turret takes a hit so if you happen to go inside a turret on a US fast battleship as I did last month then have a look around because you'll see on the outside it's all nice and smooth unless you somehow manage to either see or get up onto the roof but if you go on the interior you'll notice rivet heads or more precisely caps for rivets which are underneath them um, all over the place. Kuma Flame War asks HMS Hood is pretty universally called a battlecruiser even though she had the same armor and armament as the Queen Elizabeth that preceded her. If she's a battlecruiser because she's much faster, then why aren't the Iowas considered battlecruisers? It's pretty clear they're designed in parallel with a heavier battleship in the works. Is it simply a prestige thing that the British dreadnoughts the US have a built called battleships because it'd be inconceivable for them not to be battleships? Or is it possible Hood is called a battlecruiser because of how the lucky hit from Bismarck finished her off? And if she survived till late in the war, she'd retroactively be called a fast battleship. Well, it is uh, something of a heated debate. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> call the Iowa's battlecruiser normally and you're in for a bit of pain. Call the... Say Hood is either a definitively a battlecruiser or a fast battleship in either statement is guaranteed to also start an argument on the internet. Involve both of them and, oh boy, watch the fireworks fly. Um, however, you do raise a fair point and it's not something that I think can be dealt with in the form of a dry dock answer because you'd have to leave out so many things the usual suspects would just start trying to tear into it so instead at some point in the next couple of months i think i'm going to do a video on it so uh, watch out for that <laughs> and inevitably watch out for the arguments that will break out in the comment section andre gardner asks can you elaborate on some of the preservation and anti-corrosion measures used on museum ships one of the best ways of preserving a ship is actually just basic maintenance. And now I, that sounds simple and it can sound a bit harsh when you see ships that aren't in the best of states. But it is actually an incredibly complex, time consuming and expensive process as pretty much every curator of every ship that I spoke to uh, would elaborate on in great depth if you let them. Because you can't just go down to the local hardware shop and go, yeah, I'll have, you know, 1600 gallons of dulux or something like that you have to have a specialist paint to uh, paint the ships and moreover you if you really want to preserve them long term you have to get even more specialist paint than just ship paint you have to get you know a paint that w is designed to last for years and years and years and years and years um which runs into additional complications because usually paint that's designed to last for absolutely ages contains all sorts of interesting chemicals to make it incredibly stable which these days have all sorts of environmental regulations put on them so you either end up having to jump through about a billion and one hoops or you end up having to go for something even more expensive like some kind of epoxy based paint so just keeping the things that rust away from the salt water environment is a huge step in preservation and anti-corrosion obviously you also have um anodes and cathodes so sacrificial usually zinc blocks to prevent uh, elect, uh elect, basically electrolysis um from rusting away at the ship um, if you don't then as people have found pretty much since the first iron ships went into the water then the hull will rust away incredibly fast um, you also can help preserve the ship and keep it from rusting by sealing off sections um, so that you know there may be bulkheads and hatchways and so forth that you in the ship's course of operation could be or would be open to the environment or things like the the funnel so 
where it's not necessary to have those open, make sure those stay closed, keeps the water and the moisture out of the ship. You have to have a decent HVAC system uh, or aircon system, depending on what you want, you want to call it. But basically circulate the air out, get the damp air out, get fresh, hopefully relatively dry air in, stabilize the temperature of the ship, you know, prevent condensation. All of this kind of stuff is also vital. It's also one of the reasons why most of the bigger museum ships tend to have guided tour routes and sections you can't access. Not just to stop people getting lost and not just because some sections of these ships won't necessarily have been preserved in a state where they want them to be presented to visitors, but also in large part because the fewer areas that people are actually in, the cheaper and easier it is to maintain the ship because you only have to sort out some really high volume air circulation in specific parts of the ship and you can lock other parts out and almost do the same kind of procedures as the ship would experience when it's in the mothball fleet and you know those kind of preservation procedures will keep the ship in good condition but you don't necessarily want people to be walking in and out of them without any kind of protection and another thing that definitely comes across is an ounce of prevention is better than 10 times as much cure. So if you are able, and this is in, funding is a huge issue, if you are able to keep the ship painted uh, and scraped and so forth, then you and you keep on top of little patches of rust that might develop, then it's relatively speaking not too expensive if you neglect that or if you just flat out don't have the funds and you can't keep up with the regular maintenance then rust and so forth starts to spread and then it'll be far 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 more expensive in the long run to actually then have to sandblast things down possibly replace hull panels repaint etc etc so it's it's a very delicate complex and ongoing process and each ship has its own unique challenges as well. So, for example, Alabama, as you can see here, is well down in the south. So she has to contend with a lot of moisture issues and, of course, the occasional hurricane. Whereas somewhere out on the west coast like Iowa or Midway, they've also got to contend with a lot of moisture and heat issues, but perhaps slightly fewer hurricanes. But then if you go further north, you... On, uh, say up the east coast somewhere like uh, New Jersey or Salem or Massachusetts you've got to contend with cold weather um, and extremes of temperature going back going both ways if you are unfortunate enough to be USS Texas you've got to cope with the fact that the water is the next nearest thing to a naturally occurring acid um, he's, he's quite literally parked in some of the worst water for preserving a ship that real stuff really likes to eat the hull um, so every ship will have its own unique challenges on top of everything else so um, deck maintenance for example is vital because the teak deck serves a huge insulation uh, purpose so you know down in the south if you don't maintain your teak deck the interior of your ship's going to become an oven it all the way up in the north if you don't maintain your deck the interior of the ship's going to become an icebox with loads of condensation when it eventually melts and so on and so forth dm phoenix asks there is an oft-repeated notion that when a large ship sinks it will cause a powerful suction force in the water that will drag down everything and everyone in the immediate vicinity down with the vessel in a giant swirling vortex this is referenced in various media where lifeboats and survivors in the water are advised to move away from the area to save their lives. However, Charles Jugin of RMS Titanic very clearly stated that he felt no such suction as he plunged down into the sea on the aft end of the ship. He was also reported to be highly intoxicated at the time of this event, however. So what really happens in such sinkings? Is there actually a danger of suction we should all be aware of on our next cruise? So I have addressed this in a few other dry docks, but it does bear repeating. There are various notions about the suction generated by ships when they go underwater. Now, the problem is it's not something that is consistent across all sinkings. Yes, there was a Mythbusters episode on it. Um, no, it's not the best. Um, it doesn't really cover a lot of the issues involved. I'll try and briefly explain some of them here. So... Firstly, it depends on the size of the ship. 
and the reasons for that will become clear in a minute. Secondly, it depends on how quickly that ship sinks. And to a, a slight degree, it can also depend on the angle the ship sinks at, but not maybe not quite so much that. Now, there are other dangers when it comes to a ship sinking, especially a warship sinking in combat. People have mentioned things like foaming water from air that's escaping from the ship. That, obviously, you'll be negatively buoyant in that. You will sink into that. Yes, it is a hazard. You know, Just because suction exists in some circumstances doesn't negate these other hazards. Oil on the surface is another, another good one that can um, kill people pretty quickly. Explosions as the ship goes down and so forth. But you have to remember that even a sinking ship has to obey the laws of physics. A sinking ship occupies a certain volume. It displaces a certain amount of water. That's how it stays afloat. Now, if enough water gets in, then the ship will sink. But the fact is the ship still has a mass and a volume. When that goes down, bearing in mind that most of the water that's internal to the ship at this point is probably going to stay internal. It's not just going to flow through the ship. Um, so you can, unless it's in cat absolute catastrophic condition, consider the ship as a single volumetric mass. Um, and if it's really bad, then consider it two or three volumetric masses. But regardless, when that goes below the surface, it is pushing water out of the way beneath it. And as it goes down, it's leaving a void above it. That void has to be filled. So the water from around the ship will flow in and, you know, fill in that, that void space. As the ship continues to descend, the water that is directly above it is effectively going to fall with the ship. It's going to continue down with the vessel for the most part. And what's going to happen then is obviously now that's creating a new void space above. And so more water is going to come in and be brought down as it continues to fall. So you basically have, um, if you've seen a, a fountain of water going up, so it goes up in a jet, then spreads out and falls out to the side, you basically got that effect, but in reverse. Now, as the ship goes further and further down, it's creating this column of water that's going down with it, which is creating suction. It's also pushing water out of the way underneath it, which is creating vortexes around it. And the further it goes down, the more water there is on the sides of the column that can flow in, and to a certain extent is also being drawn in by the vortexes. And so the suction effect at the surface becomes less the further and further the ship goes down. Unfortunately, if you're caught in that initial suction effect, and you're taken down with the ship, you're going to stay in the column of falling water unless something changes. And that's a very horrible way to die. Now, the reason that that suction can take someone down with it and why it doesn't happen so much with smaller craft is that obviously it the water weighs a certain amount because it's got to replace the amount of water that the ship is displacing. So if a, you know, 20 tonne boat with a surface area of, I don't know, let's say arbitrarily 100 square meters sinks, when you're considering it from a top-down perspective, um, you know, that amount of water spread out over that amount of space and it sinks relatively slowly, the force of the water that's flowing is not that great per square meter or per square foot, depending on what measurement system you like. So if you're in a, you know, a 40 foot yacht and it goes down there'll be a little bit of suction but it's you're not really going to feel it in 99.999% of all circumstances however thanks to the square cube rule a ship can be much much more massive whilst proportionally actually having much less surface area relative to to the mass um you see this with all, all sorts of ships but basically if you have like a 40 45000 ton ship going down if you look at the total surface area, looking down vertically, that's, you know, the, it represents the initial column of water that the ship is dragging down with it. If you divide the mass by the surface area, or the surface area by the mass, you'll get a very different figure than if you're doing it with a 20-foot yacht, even if they have the same relative uh, densities. So the suction effect is going to be worse on larger ships, but then again, 
this is the, the where the speed of sinking comes in the speed of how a vessel goes down it also affects it because if the vessel is very gradually going down i.e it's just about negatively buoyant then the column of water is also moving relatively slowly and there's plenty so and therefore anything that's caught in it if it has any kind of natural resistance like say human body's buoyancy it will probably overcome it whereas if the hull goes down quite quickly then the velocity of the column of water is faster and thus much more likely to overcome any natural resistance that someone might have now to illustrate this the best you'd want a nice big column of water tank of water um, some properly dyed water with a huge light source behind it and a relatively viscous solution a ship model and then you could see it all happen in real time however uh, i'm not the fraud laboratory or anything like that so i had to improvise a little bit but i did arrange a little experiment to kind of try and demonstrate the, the factors involved so what i did is i got the closest thing to a column of water i could and closest thing to a decent light source because this is extreme slow motion weighted a bottle cap with a penny and filled it almost to the brim with red food coloring and then as you can see with some little drops introduced the last few drops of water needed to make it negatively buoyant now because this was put together in uh, about half an hour or so you can see it is listing slightly it's not completely level so you will have a few interesting effects as a result of that but nonetheless as this a little ship simulation approaches the critical point you're going to see what i mean so you can see it's just about beginning to go now this is spaced out over small fractions of a second here it goes now there is a little trail of food coloring which is coming off the far side but you'll notice that the majority of the food coloring you can see is trying to get out but can't until it reaches a reasonable depth around about here and that's because the force of the column of water that is coming down with the cap is actually keeping it in place if you play back over that section like so you can see it happening again and this is the water column as you see just keeping it down keeping it down and then as more and more water is able to come in from the sides the force of the column down is exerted less and the dye starts to puff out in all directions bear in mind this is food coloring so it's got near enough as it makes no difference the same density as water as you can see you'll see later on it just kind of circulate and now you can also see the residual effects of that column of water although it's dispersed and obviously the things stop falling because it's hit the base a little bit further down you can see in that upper level and following the trail down to about two-thirds down the way down this screen you can actually see the vortexes formed in the dye by the fact that there is still a downwards motion in the water um, and at the top where you can see a little bit of the food coloring that spread out on the surface just as it tipped over the edge because it was capsizing you can see there as well now at this point the suction on the, the surface if this was a full scale ship wouldn't be anywhere close enough to actually bring people down but you can still see there's a degree of downward motion from the surface drawn down by what the effects of that column and you can see this kind of gap between the surface and where the dye really started to spill out and this was the main area of quote unquote suction where this water column was made up of water from the jar rather than dye from within the stand-in ship and that's how that is basically you're seeing suction at work and as i said you can see the lingering effects of that both from the surface and in this kind of middle area where there's still vortexes and a degree of movement downwards and then if you let it play on you'll see the dye billowing upwards from the impact on on the quote unquote seabed so obviously that was a fairly rapid descent um <laughs> it, this is a matter of less than a second stretched out over a couple of minutes thanks to the wonders of slow motion photography hence the reason for the massively powerful light source off to one side but hopefully it gives you the idea of what's actually going on um, now say if we had a uh, proper uh, marine dye in a tank you'd actually see the vortex of the column itself forming 
as the cap descends uh, instead of just the you know the effect of the column holding that water, that die in place until it starts to dissipate but make do with what you can <laughs> in these kinds of circumstances i guess and yes realistically a ship you wouldn't sink that quickly but this is all to scale so you know that this cap is displacing a penny and a fluid ounce or two worth of water so in order to recreate the effect that 40 plus thousand tons of battle cruiser might create then you have to accelerate the velocity um, obviously when you do this in full scale test tanks with say a 1 to 48 or a 1 to 20 scale model the sinking doesn't have to be as quickly because it's it's more to scale but nonetheless there you go you've got some idea of how suction works so yeah if i mean if you're on your next cruise and your ship is sinking well to be fair i think at that point you probably have more things to worry about than whether or not you're going to get sucked down um just get in a lifeboat and hope for the best and just i mean if, uh, unless your ship is catastrophically sinking like someone's blown out like three massive holes in the hull and flooded all the engineering spaces it's unlikely that even a modern cruise ship will generate all that much suction we're talking about you know warship levels of catastrophic sinking here um you know, titanic obviously went down relatively quickly but um just as a general rule of thumb don't stay near the uh, the sinking vessel because apart from the suction you also have all the other things that people have mentioned in the past you know, aerated water um possible explosions bits of large debris coming up to the surface with a fair degree of velocity um oil and yeah it's just not a generally pleasant place to be next we have had wasp cv7 survived the guadalcanal campaign I assume the torpedo salvo from i-19 either missed or hit other ships would it later join Saratoga and Enterprise as part of Task Force 38-58, or would it be reassigned as a training carrier along with Ranger? I suspect she would have had a gradual downgrading of her deployments. So if she survived Guadalcanal, I suspect she would have stayed as a frontline carrier in the Pacific probably till at least mid-1943, maybe two-thirds of the way into 1943, by which point a number of Essex class have now entered service and are in the Pacific. At that point, given that she is still considerably more vulnerable, she's more capable than Ranger, but she is still, obviously, as was demonstrated, very vulnerable, and the US Navy is aware of her vulnerabilities. Once there are sufficient Essex class in service, I then suspect she would have been moved over to the Atlantic, um, probably for maybe helping out with the arctic convoys and such like for a while and then stepped down again possibly um as a training carrier as you mentioned maybe working up air groups on the atlantic coast or maybe she would have been retained in the atlantic as a general purpose troubleshooting carrier much in the way that something like furious was um as a kind of transport dash uh, attack a carrier for areas where the threat isn't anticipated to be quite so large of course this is so presuming she survives all of those various incidents but yeah I, I don't think the US Navy would have kept her in the Pacific much past the the latter part of 1943 once they had more durable carriers available Captain Landlocked asks which weapon system was most successful in sinking capital ships in the European theater during World War II and was there a significant change during the war? It depends how you define capital ship and it depends how you define sunk. Because, um, for example, do you include uh, Littorio and Conte de Cavour at Taranto? If you go strictly by dreadnought or later battleships, because there's obviously Kilkis and Lemnos, uh, the Greek pre-dreadnoughts, if you include only World War I or later dreadnought style capital ships and you only include four ships that were permanently sunk by the effort then actually it's a score draw between surface gunfire and air attack uh, so air attack claims petra pavlos roma Tirpitz, and conde de Cavour right at the end of the war um, gunfire claims britannia bismarck hood and Scharnhorst, 
and then the submarines get Royal Oak and Barham as well. So in the early part of the war, the most lethal system is gunfire. Um, that, that has Britannia, Bismarck and Hood. So it has three, um, whereas the early part of the war, you only have Petra Pavlovsk is the only one that's actually, in terms of full capital ship, that's permanently downed by air attack. Dunkirk, for example, is sunk in the aftermath of Merzel Kabir, but refloated, so not including her there. Um, also, the two submarine losses, Royal Oak and Barham, are in the early part of the war. But then in the latter part of the war, you have Roma, Turbots and Conte de Cavour all sunk by air attack in the latter part of the war, and the only capital ship that's sunk by gunfire in the latter part of the war being Scharnhorst. This is, of course, for the European theatre. If you, as you asked for, if you include the Pacific theatre, then everything goes very much in shape of air power. Kra F1 asks, How important was capturing Norway to the German naval effort in World War II? For instance, if Norway remained free, would the German surface fleet be rendered effectively useless and easily bottled up by the Royal Navy? It was fairly important, but not in ways that could have been anticipated at the time. The Germans were capable of getting ships out into the Atlantic before the fall of Norway, as various raiding missions showed. Obviously, having Norway under their control made things a lot easier, and it meant that they had anchorages and fueling stops further along the voyage, so it did make things somewhat somewhat easier for them but not it wasn't necessarily essential for their efforts of getting out into the Atlantic a lot would depend on whether or not a free Norway remains neutral so if is it a case of Norway remains neutral the Germans just never attack it in which case they can still skim up and down Norwegian coastal waters so it's pretty much how the situation was in 39 and very early 1940 or is it a case of they've attacked Norway but they've been beaten off and therefore Norway has joined the Allies which changes things much more radically if Norway has joined the Allies then yeah the German fleet probably is bottled up quite com comprehensively um, of course the main utility that Norway had apart from being a fueling stop for raiders was to menace um, and threaten a breakout and for the Luftwaffe and the Kriegsmarine to base operations out against the Arctic convoys so if the Germans don't have access to Norway then their offensive against the Arctic convoys is going to be very much stymied so that's what I mean by it was important but not in a way they could have predicted in 1940 uh, considering that a in 1940 the USSR wasn't involved in World War II and well they did invaded part of Poland but they weren't taking an ongoing part of in the hostilities and of course they were still technically at this point allied to the Germans Thomas Dudkiewicz asks the racing yacht America was pressed into service and served in both sides of the U.S. Civil War. Were there any other racing and other unusual vessels that were converted to warships? Yep, there have actually been plenty of uh, yachts, racing or otherwise, and other weird and wonderful merchant vessels that have been turned into warships over the years, uh, especially in World War One and World War Two, and even to a certain extent in the Spanish-American War. Basically, whenever a navy finds itself in desperate desperate need of anything that will float you'll end up seeing pretty much anything that will float that fits the bill being taken into naval service yachts in particular tended to be used as submarine chasers in the first and second world wars when uh, they tend to be motorized and obviously designed for speed and endurance um, they were also used as uh, command ships, so they allowed uh, allowed high-ranking naval officers to have somewhere to base themselves out of that was mobile without having to impinge on the stocks of full-on warships. Uh, Admiral King's flagship, for example, for a good chunk of World War II was a converted yacht. And other merchant ships as well. I mean, obviously, um, Earlier this week we heard about the Zeebrugge raid. Now that was obviously Daffodil and Iris were Merseyside ferries um, turned into troop transports. And you had a, a few other ones like um, a lot of cross-channel ferries in World War One were taken up, turned into troop transports or patrol craft. Um, obviously you have the various armed merchant cruisers that we're more used to. And even harbour vessels were turned into various weird and wonderful things. So I've shown a picture before, for example, of a side-wheeled paddle steamer that was used 
in a previous life as a harbour vessel, which was then turned into a floating and fairly agile anti-aircraft battery ship for harbour defence by the Royal Navy in World War II. Admiral Tiberius asks, has there ever been a 1v1 action between ships that resulted in a boarding action and both sides suffering extreme to near total casualties, i.e. neither side wanted to give in or surrender? It has definitely been a thing that has happened on occasion throughout history, although as time goes on it becomes less and less common, largely because warships generally tend to become larger and larger, which means more crew, which means that A, there's more opportunity for one side or the other to gain a decisive advantage, and B, there's also statistically likely to be more people on one side or the other who are more willing to surrender than fight to the very last man, although these kind of things still did occur, especially with a few small ship actions. But one of the ones that definitely always stands out to me, and I will make a point of when I eventually make a video on the battle, is the account of the Battle of Lepanto. And this is where you tend to see these kind of sort of neither side ever gives in battles, where the war is not just between nations, but it has some other context to it, whether it be a civil war or, in the case of, the, of Lepanto, very much a religious element to it. It adds a little bit extra, um, shall we say, determination to both sides' uh, willingness to kill each other. And after Lepanto, there were accounts of quite a number of ships, including some fairly large for the time and, and famous ones. I think one of the Knights Hospitaller ships, for example, were found days or weeks after the battle by merchant ships plying their trade in the Mediterranean. And they were basically ghost ships because they'd clearly rammed and then either boarded or been boarded by another vessel but both crews had fought each other to the point that basically almost everybody was dead or everybody and whoever was left was severely wounded and passed away later on or possibly yet literally everybody died um with the, I mean, with the last few succumbing to wounds pretty quickly which led to these various ships that were completely uncrewed but had no one out to board them either because they'd killed all the boarders just floating around the Mediterranean, being picked up by uh, people who obviously were somewhat um, put off by the uh, sight of floating charnel houses. Of course, um, there probably were even more in the aftermath of that battle that just wandered the Mediterranean and then sank because no one ever found them again. But yeah, it was a pretty grim and slightly disturbing thing to read. Paul from Chicago asks, How did a nation's ships get insurance? Uh, the short answer is that they don't. <laughs> um, nobody in their right mind is going to insure a warship, especially these days. Um, I mean, technically they're insured by dint of having the government backing them, but if a warship gets blown up and sinks, uh, yeah, there's no insurance payout. It's just the government deciding if they want to replace it or not. And if it gets damaged, they have to decide whether they want to repair it or not. There are, to be fair, bits of of the ship that will be insured but they won't nest they won't be insured against wartime damage they'll be insured against their own malfunction so you know, engines these days the electronics that kind of thing there'll be manufacturers guarantees warranties and insurances on those but that'll only cover regular wear and tear not the enemy chucked several tons of high explosives at you and now you're in several pieces across the bottom of the atlantic and that brings us to an end for this week. Thank you very much for listening, and thank you very much for putting up with having the Patreon Dry Dock split into two segments. Um, it was very much appreciated that people didn't raise too much issue with that, because, yes, I was very, very tired last week. And, well, things are going to possibly continue in that vein, because I am going back across the Atlantic in the, a few weeks, so, <laughs> for those of you who are interested, I'm going to be in Canada. This time I'm going to be with Dr. Clark because, well, I'm going to see HMS, HMCS Hyder and HMCS Sackville. As you know, HMCS Hyder is the last surviving tribal class destroyer, and Dr. Clark would probably kill me if I went and saw it before he did. So, uh, yeah, there may also be a bit of a race for the gangplank going on there as well, but never mind. Um... So, I am heading over to Canada 
on June the 3rd, which my calendar reliably informs me is, as of the time of recording, in exactly three weeks' time. And I'll be there for just a fraction over a week, because I'll be arriving on the Friday and then heading back uh, the f w w following week, Sunday, on the 12th. So if th um, those of you who happen to be in Canada or in the immediate vicinity thereof would like to come and say hi to myself, Dr. Clark, or both, uh, we will obviously be publishing a schedule in a week or two's time and uh, hope to see a few of you there. And if anyone who lives in the area is able to tell me what kind of weather to pack for, that would also be greatly appreciated. Thank you.